God, what God, God did, uh, sorry. So what God did is that um, in the middle of the woman's cycle, the woman produces a lot of mucus that comes from the uterus and the cervix. And it's a lot of mucus that then flows right outside um, through the birth passage and she would experience wetness. It is the mucus you have been told of fertility, the slippery mucus that is clear, looks like egg white and causes wetness. That mucus is alkaline and its first job is to neutralize all this acid so that the sperm does not die. And the second thing the mucus does is that it keeps the sperm alive for three to five days. So these are very important scientific principles that will help us understand how um, uh, the ovulation cycle can be used for birth spacing. Now, if you think about the duration um, of uh, the mucus, it would usually come for one day, two days or three days. This may be different in different women. It may also be different in the same woman. So every month it may be different. And uh, when, when we, we um, let's see, when we ask about um, the duration of the acid, it takes about three days before the acid is resumed. So, so if the mucus has been produced and then after one, two or three days, it stops being produced anymore, the woman still has a lot of mucus inside of her even though she is not wet anymore. So now she is dry, but there is still a lot of mucus inside the bath passage. It takes about three days for that mucus to be absorbed for the acid to resume. If you are then to take uh, the three days of mucus or one day of mucus or two days of mucus, and you add that to the days, uh, the three days before the acid comes back, then we are able to establish the duration of fertility of that woman. So if that woman had her mucus for one day, then that month you'll be fertile for four days. If that woman had her mucus for two days, then that month you'll be fertile for five days. If she experiences her mucus for three days, then that month she's fertile for six days. So remember the duration of fertility is the number of days of mucus plus three days. And these three days are the days before acid resumes in the bath passage after the dryness of the mucus, okay? So very, very important biological facts that we must keep in mind all the time. So now let us look at the fertility cycle. So it, it, it uh, it would start the same way like the menstrual cycle. So it starts, we count with bleeding, the first day of the flow. So if there is any spotting, it is considered part of the old cycle. Once there is a, an, a, a flow, then that becomes the first day of the, the menses. So the woman will experience wetness for different number of days in different women. And that's the time when she has her periods and then she will go into a period of dryness. The, the menses are over and there is a duration of dryness which we shall refer to as waiting for fertility. After that, she goes into a second duration of wetness during which she notices the clear mucus uh, that is stretchy, that is very slippery. And she would notice that uh, there is a change of the, the vaginal mucus. Now, the three days after the mucus has ended is very, very, very important as we have seen in our biological facts. So it is important for her to count another three days after the mucus is over, that during that time, we are still fertile. From the fourth day after the end of the mucus, we are no longer fertile and fertility is over. And what we would expect is the menses. So unlike the menstrual cycle that we have wasted so much time teaching our girl child, that uh, you only get menses and then we are completely quiet about the mucus of fertility. 
the fertility cycle teaches that there are two times the woman will experience wetness in her cycle. That's during the menses and during the time she has the mucus of fertility. So what do we do? During the time, just as the periods are coming to an end, until the mucus is over is a very, very important time for self-examination of a woman who is trying to understand her fertility. And what we usually tell the ladies is, as your periods are coming to an end, when you go to the bathroom to use a bathroom, before you uh, pass your urine, you wipe yourself uh, with the tissue and uh, you ask yourself what kind of wetness you are experiencing. The space between the bath passage and the, the anus is very sensitive to touch. As you bring your tissue downwards towards the, the, the stool passage, ask yourself what kind of wetness you are experiencing. And you would be able to say that that wetness feels like blood and you check and you find your periods are not yet over. The next time you check, you find it is either that, that white, very thick mucus, or you just feel dry and you know that the periods are over. And the next thing you experience is the slippery mucus or wetness. Now, the reason we suggest that you, you wipe yourself before you pass urine is so that you have a chance to feel what is there before it is washed off by the urine. So during the, the, the time when the periods are coming to an end, until the mucus starts and the time it ends, then it is very important for the woman to be self-aware so that she can tell what is going on in her body. Now, if you were to chat and say, mucus has started, and you wait until the next menses start, you would find that the duration is a very constant 12 to 14 days. In other words, when the mucus starts, we can predict that the periods will come in 12 to 14 days. Uh, but if you check from the time when the menses start to the time the mucus comes, you find that that duration is not constant. In other words, you cannot use the beginning of your periods to determine when your fertility will come because this may change due to various reasons. And these reasons have been mentioned by many of the other speakers uh, previously. The duration of fertility would therefore then be as we have learned in our biological facts, from the time the mucus starts, check how many days that mucus lasts and you add three days and you find that the woman is generally fertile for four to six days in the month from the beginning of the mucus to the end of the mucus plus another three days of, of dryness, she is still fertile. So that is very important to know that as a fertile window. Now, from the fourth day after the end of the mucus, so the mucus ended here, we have counted three days, the woman is still fertile. From the fourth day, the acid has reestablished and the woman is now infertile until her menses come. So the period of infertility, when she cannot conceive, is from the fourth day after the end of the mucus until her periods begin. So that is the period of infertility. Now, the period from when the mucus has ended, uh, sorry, the, the period from when the menses have ended until when mucus starts is also infertile, but for a couple that is trying to space their child, is trying to postpone the next pregnancy, then it becomes an, an area where you have to be very, very careful when you're using natural family planning. Because what you're waiting for, which is our fertility, can actually get you pregnant. So the question here is, what do we do such that there is no sexual relation happening while the woman has the mucus, yet she does not know that she has the mucus? So unlike this side where we know for sure fertility is over, here we are waiting for fertility and one has to be very careful, even though one is infertile, if there's any sexual relation just before the mucus comes, and the mucus is present and you did not know it was there, then one would conceive. Now, the most important thing to remember here 
is that the last three days, during these three days, after the end of the mucus, the woman is dry. She is not experiencing the mucus flow. These three days are after the mucus. So it's very important to remember mucus plus three days constitutes our fertile window, okay? Now, how do we use this knowledge to then space our children uh, or to get children? And the beauty about this method is that it will work whether your periods are regular or irregular. It will work when you're waiting for your, your periods if you've just delivered, and it will work if your periods are very regular. So we have just understood that the mucus plus three days is a fertile window. And that is the time to get a child. So if you're living apart as a couple and you're interested in having a child and uh, you, you are wondering when to come together, the idea is that as soon as the mucus becomes evident, then one of the couples would then move to the other. So if the husband is easier to, to move, then he would go to where the wife is if it is easier for the wife to come, then the wife would come to where he is. And during that window of fertility, then they would have sexual relations and they would be able to achieve a pregnancy. So the, the knowledge of the fertility cycle can be used to space the children or to get the child. Now, if one is um, spacing the children and uh, it will become clear why I prefer to use birth spacing, instead of family planning uh, as we go along. If one is not planning to have a child, then the duration, the place where we know we are infertile is from the fourth day after the end of the mucus until the menses. So this is an important part. As soon as the menses start, then you must stop because we know there are some people who get uh, their ovulation very soon uh, after the end of the mucus. So, the, after the end of the menses. So we are saying here, from the fourth day after the mucus has ended until the, the period start, that period you can have um, your sexual relations liberally because there is no uh, chance of conceiving a child. I call this the rabbit zone uh, because it has no rules and you will soon understand uh, why I call it so. Now, the area we discussed, as the periods have come to an end, as we are waiting for our fertility, here the couple has to be extremely, extremely careful because we do not want to have any sexual relations while there is mucus yet we don't know. So there are three very important rules. Anytime sexual relations are going to happen after the woman has experienced bleeding, and this bleeding could be her menses. It could be an abnormal bleeding in the middle of the cycle. It could be the bleeding after delivering a baby. The minute she has experienced bleeding and it has ended, we are waiting for fertility. We are in this area here and we are waiting for fertility that can get us pregnant. So there are three very important rules and these are the only rules in this method. And these rules say, you should not have any sexual relations in the morning. You should not have repeat sexual relations and you should not have daily sexual relations during the time after bleeding as we are waiting for fertility. So no morning sex, no repeat sex, no daily sex. Now, these rules uh, may sound strange, but if you do not understand why they're important, then you will never obey them and you will not be able to use this method. Now, it is on the assumption that the woman is not doing night duty, that she is doing uh, normal day duties. Now, why shouldn't we have any sexual relations in the morning? The idea is that from the time the woman went to sleep, for four, six, or eight hours, she has been lying down in bed asleep. The mucus could come during that night and it may be full in the bath passage, but she is not aware of it because she has been lying down for those four to six hours. Now, can she run to the bathroom and check whether she has mucus or not? The answer is no, 
because the mucus is thick and for it to flow, for the woman to experience the flow of the mucus and the wetness that comes with it, she would need to be upright, doing something, she is seated or walking about, doing her things for at least six to eight hours. So she needs to be upright for six to eight hours for her to experience the flow. And therefore you can have sexual relation in the morning while the bath passage is full of mucus, but she was not aware of it. And when she went to check in the bathroom, she did not detect the wetness. So if you are planning to space your children, then avoid having sex in the morning during the time when we are waiting for fertility. Why should we not have repeat sex? So repeat sex is where you have sexual relations and then you want to rest for one, two or three hours to regain your energy and then to have another sexual experience. Now that is what we are calling a repeat, uh, repeat sex. Now remember, if because a woman has been observing herself during the day and by evening when she's going to sleep, there is no mucus. We know that the bath passage is acidic. So the first sexual experience, the sperm will find the acidic environment of the bath passage and that initial sperm will die in 10 minutes. The woman will not get pregnant. However, in that one or two or three hours of resting, if mucus comes, then the woman would not know that she has it and she would get pregnant from the second intercourse. So no repeat sex when we are waiting for fertility. And why shouldn't you have daily sex? When a woman experiences a, a, sexual, um, a sexual encounter, the next day in the morning, she will have vaginal discharge that comes after the sexual experience. It will have a bit of the semen, it will have the lubrication she produced during the sexual experience. And this discharge will remain throughout the day. She usually would need to wear a liner and by evening, she will still have some slippery discharge coming from the bath passage. It is therefore very difficult for her to know if fertility has come because the mucus of fertility may, may feel the same. And therefore, if she has a sexual relation, the next night, there is a very high possibility that her fertility could have come and she wasn't aware about it. So if we are waiting for fertility, it is bleeding that was the last thing that you noticed. Then the idea is if you had sexual intercourse last night because there was no mucus, then allow one or two nights to pass for the mucus of uh, the sexual experience to clear so that the woman has her normal uh, mucus back and is able to tell whether the mucus of fertility has come to make a decision for another day. So no daily relations, if you had sexual uh, relations last night, allow for one or two nights uh, so that um, the, the, the woman is able to check and confirm whether her fertility has come. So when you understand these three rules, then you understand why I call this site the rabbit zone, because this site has no rules and the most men will remember it uh, many, many times, okay? Now, um, let me discuss the calendar method and why it may fail and why we do not encourage the use of the calendar. So a lot of women nowadays have apps that they can find on their phones and these apps uh, track their menses. So you, you, you indicate when your period start and it starts predicting for you when you shall be fertile that month. That kind of app is not good. And I want to demonstrate to you why you cannot use your periods to determine when fertility will come. Now, the commonest cycle is a 28 day cycle. So this is not the normal cycle. It is the commonest. Uh, and, and there will be women who would have a 21 day cycle, some will have a 36 day cycle. And all this will be regular or irregular and uh, it may be different in different women. But the commonest cycle is, is uh, 28 days. Now, if you remember from our discussion, we said that ovulation occurs 14 days before the periods. So if a woman's period started today, yeah. and you count 
um, 14 days backwards, then you in a 28 day cycle, you'll find that revelation will have occurred on day 14. And in a 28 day cycle, this day 14 will be day 14, whether you come from the back or from the front of the cycle, day 14 will remain day 14. And this, uh, we then say three days before that day and three days after, then becomes the fertile window. And when we were teaching the calendar method, we tell the woman when your period start um, and end, then you can have sexual relations maybe up to about day nine. And then after that, you stop and you allow the fertility window to pass. And then you start again on day 18 or 19 until your periods come. So that is how the calendar method uh, used to be taught. Now, you would then understand that uh, if a woman was going to have her, her cycle shorter this month, assume this month her period is going to become 21 days because she is stressed or maybe she changed jobs or there is some change uh, in her general environment, Remember that her periods haven't come, so she doesn't know that this month it will be shorter. But if you count 14 days backwards, you discover that in this month she will ovulate on day seven and not day 14. And according to the calendar, she should not get pregnant, but she is going to get pregnant because she ovulated earlier than usual. Now, if she had been taught to just count, this woman will get pregnant even though she counted very well and followed her calendar accurately. Now assume that this month her periods are going to come 34 days because again of stress or changes in her body. Remember she does not know in advance, so she only knows that her periods have started. If she was counting based on this knowledge of a 28 day cycle, then what would happen is that if we count our 14 days backwards, we'd find that this cycle she is going to ovulate on day 20. And according to her calendar, day 20, she should not get pregnant, but she's going to get pregnant because ovulation will have occurred later than day 14. So this irregularity of the first part of the cycle, which we described when we were talking about fertility, the fertility cycle, the regular part of the cycle is from the mucus or the time of ovulation, going to the periods. But the part from periods to ovulation can be very irregular as you can see in this diagram. Here it is 14 days, here it is seven days, here it is 20 days. And if a woman has delivered a baby and is breastfeeding, some of those women will not get their periods for, for six months, for, for 12 months, I have seen up to to two, to two years without periods when uh, breastfeeding. How would, then, how would she know when to have relations without getting pregnant if she was relying on counting? So this is where the knowledge of the fertility mucus becomes very important. The knowledge of the, the, uh, of the period when we are waiting for fertility so that from the time she sees her menses and the menses end, she is constantly waiting for her fertility. And even if it takes six months or even if it takes one year, usually the fertility comes before the periods. And that is why women who are trying to count would usually get pregnant as they are waiting for their periods to start. So not having the knowledge of the fertility mucus then makes this uh, uh, method um, uh, very difficult to use and uh, it can fail. So the fact that the thought that ovulation occurs on day 14 is a myth, and I would like you to do away with that uh, knowledge. It is not helpful when we are dealing with natural family planning. Now, uh, I'll give you a sneak preview. How would we use this knowledge to try and get a baby boy or a baby girl? Now, the sperm that carries the Y chromosome, which gives us a boy, moves very fast, but dies early. The sperm that carries the X chromosome is slow, but it lives longer. The egg of the woman is only alive for one day, as we have known, and the period of ovulation, when the fertility is four to six days, 
the day of ovulation, the actual day of ovulation remains God's secret. So this is a period of fertility, not ovulation. The period of fertility is four to six days. But on which day does the egg, uh, is the egg released? We do not know. In some women, it may be uh, uh, at the beginning of the fertile window. In some women, it may be towards the end of the fertile window. That remains God's secret. And therefore, even if a couple is trying to see whether they can influence the outcome of the sex of their child, they must remember that a child is God's gift. And finally, God will give you what he desires that you bring up. So this is not a um, hard and fast rule. Uh, it also depends on God's will. And uh, it is important we keep that in mind. So assume a woman has her mucus for three days. Then we add the three days after the mucus, then we have a fertile window of six days. If this woman is trying to get a baby boy, the minute she notices the mucus, she stops any sexual relations. And she counts how many days her mucus comes, then adds the three days and has sexual relations on the very last day of her fertility. If her periods come, then we know she did not ovulate on day six. The next month, her periods, uh, her mucus starts. She counts how many days of mucus, adds the three days, but this time has sexual relations on the fifth day. If she still gets her periods, then we know she didn't ovulate on day five. And the next month, they try to have sexual relations on day four. If she misses her periods, there is a very high chance that they had sexual relations on the same day that the egg is released. And because the male sperm moves very fast, there's a very high chance that that child will be a boy, maybe up to 80 or 90%. Now, if the couple is trying to get a girl child, then the idea is to have sexual relations early before the egg is released so that the male sperm has died and only the female sperm is around in the mucus. So that by the time ovulation happens, only the female sperm is available. That would then mean that the, a couple trying to get a child who is a girl would start immediately, they notice the mucus, they would have sexual relations on that day one. Then they would totally avoid any sexual relations for the next seven days not so as not to put any more male sperm inside that mucus, and then they wait for their periods. If the periods come, then the next month they would have sexual relations on day two, and then again avoid intercourse for the seven days. And then they would keep doing that until they miss their periods, and chances are that that child would end up being a girl. The very important rule here is that during this period of fertility, the sexual relation should only be once, only once during the window of fertility. So before fertility, you are using the three rules. After fertility, when the, in the infertile phase, you can do what you want. But during the six days of fertility or four days or five days, whatever it will be, you only have sexual relations just once because we are trying to achieve a particular objective. So that is how the knowledge of the, the fertility cycle can be used to try and influence the sex of the child. Now, let me tell you a bit about my journey um, in, in, in medical school and the great deception as I call it. Now, I was not born into the Catholic faith, uh, unlike most of you. And um, it is also true that uh, uh, some, some of the people uh, would have experienced um, would be Catholics right from the beginning. I joined the Catholic faith from the Protestant movement as an adult. I was already a gynecologist. I had been trained to use contraceptives. I had used them myself and I, I dispensed contraceptives for a long time. And in medical school, I was taught the calendar and counting method. And the way the professor would start this discussion is, uh, this method is completely useless. I am only teaching it to you uh, because it is in the curriculum. Otherwise, it is a waste of time. And um, it was the only method I was taught of natural family planning. 
I taught it to my patients. They tried it, it didn't work. And uh, eventually we both agreed that con uh, natural family planning does not work. That you find is that the attitude of many people, even amongst the Catholics, there are doctors who are Catholic, there are Catholic uh, followers who are on contraceptives because they genuinely believe that there is no alternative. And uh, in medical school, the mucus of fertility is taught as a different subject. Ovulation is taught as a different subject. Menstruation is taught as a different subject. And pregnancy is taught as a separate subject. So we are not taught these things the way I have described them to you. They are never put together. And, and therefore you find that um, it's not that doctors and nurses don't want to teach natural family planning. Uh, it is that they had not been taught the correct methods in school. So we basically are denied the knowledge of natural family planning in medical school because the people who make contraceptives need us to reach the patients. So if I am ignorant about natural family planning, or I am taught a method like the calendar that fails, then I will be able to give my patients uh, contraceptives, completely feeling justified that there is nothing like natural family planning that works. So this is a great deception. And when you see doctors and nurses who do not know this, then it is because it was denied, that knowledge was denied of them. Now, what I have just taught you, I was taught by Dr. Karanja just four years ago. And he had taught natural family planning for over 30 years. And his greatest frustration is that he could not teach it to an illiterate woman. Because the way it was taught previously required that you have a calendar, that you chat on the calendar. It required you check your body temperatures, you check this, uh, where the position of the cervix is, and many, many other methods that have been used in the past. And he kept wondering, how do I teach this uh, uh, family planning to women who do not know how to read and write? Uh, and when he looked at the six or so methods that he was teaching that time and pulled out the science out of those, he came up with this simplified uh, version that I have taught you. The most basic knowledge of science that you would need to use the natural family plan. So in as far as uh, contraceptives are concerned, I consider myself uh, damaged goods. I consider myself damaged by uh, misinformation, by the great deception. And I know couples who have been on contraceptives, couples that I put on contraceptives before I came to know the truth. And, and um, what I would like to encourage everyone who has gone through this, is that your knowledge of natural family planning can help us save the next generation of our children from ever having to use contraceptives. Okay, now there are three key strategies I wanted to share with you that I think we can use for winning people over to natural birth spacing. And the, the, the first one is that we need to teach boys and girls what I call the human life cycle, and I'll take you through that if we have time. Um, we need to teach the girl child the ovulation cycle. She needs to know herself. She needs to know what is going on when she has that mucus so that she can understand that it is her gift of giving us children, a gift that she must take care of. And then the, the other one is that all the adults need to be taught about the fertility cycle. This knowledge should not be a secret. Everybody should be able to tell that if you have sexual relations, at a time when the woman is fertile, you're going to get a child. And that is important for all of us to know and to know how we can use that knowledge to space our children. Now, these three would need to be taught in that order to avoid abuse of knowledge. So we need to teach our children the human life cycle first. Then we need to teach the girl child the ovulation cycle. At the time, she, we teach her the menstrual cycle at the age of 12 or 13, we need to teach her both about menstruation and ovulation. And then um, uh, when they are a little older, then both the boys and the girls are taught about the fertility cycle. We'll see why that is important. So I'll, I'll take the next few minutes to teach you the human life cycle because I'm almost certain nobody bothered to teach you this. So in the beginning, there was God. 
God is eternal. He was, he is, he will always be. And God created the whole of the universe before he created us. It is man who needs the environment. The environment does not need us. We must learn to take care of the environment because it is us who need it. And remember, God gave us the seed. He gave us the animals, but he did not give us the land. The land remains his. Then God created the man in his own image and likeness, created him for goodness. And he created him with everything that he needed, but then he found him to be lonely. And what God did is he removed something from that man and created the most beautiful thing the man had ever seen, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And what happened from that point onwards is that man is complete as a man, but he only represents half of human nature. The woman is complete as a woman, but she only um, represents half of human nature. Until you bring these two together in matrimony, you cannot understand the fullness of the human person. So if you had men only in the, in the, in the, on earth, uh, the, woman, the human race would have been extinct. If you had women only, the human race would have been extinct. Then these two uh, disobeyed God, and for that reason fractured our relationship with him, and we were sent away from God. And God in his own mercy and grace sent us his own son to, to uh, redeem us uh, from that spiritual fallenness and bring us back to God. So the sacrifice of Christ then becomes the beginning of the new human race. Now, the human life cycle then begins with God, uh, represented here by Christ, and it starts with the sacrament of matrimony, where the man and the woman give themselves one to each other, totally for life, in, in a relationship that is open to life, and that is geared towards bringing up those children in the knowledge of God. And it is in this uh, state of marriage that they were to experience fruitfulness. Remember that the child is conceived in the mind of God first, because he has a plan, he has something he wants this child to do in the future, and then he decides which family will be given the honor of bringing up that child. And during the time they have their sexual relation, the man will give his seed, the woman will give his seed, and God gives a soul, making us co-creators, and we have new life beginning in the mother. That child is only in the mother's womb for nine months, and because the child does not belong to the mother and doesn't belong to the man, but belongs to God, at the end of nine months, the child is delivered. When you deliver something, you are a messenger. It did not belong to you. You have given the owner. The child is born and is delivered to God. And this child is supposed to be brought up in a family where both mommy and daddy are present because we learn different things from mommy and different things from daddy. And it is the many families that then form the community. The community is not made of individuals. The community is made of families. Everybody you meet in the community has a father and a mother, whether they know them or not, and they need to be honored as a human being, and their parents also need to be honored. It is from that community that we get the next couple that then continues with the human life cycle. Now, because we are spiritual, we are both here, body and spirit. At the end of our time, in what we call physical death, the spirit is then released and becomes eternal. And some of the spirits will then find their way to God. And unfortunately, some may be sent away from God. It is our business as Christians to evangelize to the community so that this black arrow completely disappears and that all the souls that God created are able to be restored to him so that we can live with him in eternity. Now, if you destroy any part of this cycle, if you allow our children to grow not believing there is a God, if you allow children to be confused that I can be born male and I say I am female or vice versa, or that two males can have a relationship or two females can have a relationship, you would destroy the human life cycle. If we start saying that marriage is overrated, that we don't need to get married, that we can live together for two or three years as we experiment, 
or that we have done a traditional marriage and we do not need to take the sacrament of matrimony. Or we are just trying to have sex for fun and we have no intention of having children. Then we start to experience fruitfulness that is outside of marriage. The temptation to terminate pregnancies becomes more. The temptation to use contraceptives becomes more. We end up with children living in the streets. We end up with broken families. And when that happens, we have a broken community and this arrow grows much bigger the more we are broken from the family level. So you understand then that it is very, very important that all children are taught the human life cycle at as an early age as possible so that they understand how we relate to God and we relate to one another from family all the way to the community so that we are able to teach them the dignity of the human person the dignity of, of marriage, the dignity of the sexual act, and the right to life of every child that has been conceived in the mind of God. So um, when it comes to the girl child, then we teach her the ovulation cycle instead of the menstrual cycle. Since we have gone through most of this, I'll be able to move very fast. We have already agreed that this is what happens in the woman's cycle. Now, remember, because it is the little girl we are teaching, we are not mentioning the plus three. We just want her to be aware of the wetness of menses, a period of dryness, wetness of the mucus, a period of dryness, then the mucus comes. So this is what we are training her to, 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 to keep in mind. So what would she chat or what should she be aware of when her menses start? and when her menses end to know how many days her periods have been, then she needs to note when the mucus has come and when the mucus has ended to know how many days of mucus there was. And then when the next uh, menses start, which is the end of the previous cycle. Now, it, if you look at it in phases, then phase one would be when she has her menses, phase two would be the first dryness, uh, phase three would be the wetness of the mucus, and phase three of the cycle would then be the dryness before the mucus comes, uh, the periods come, sorry. Now, we would teach her to be keen and note that from the mucus to the time the next periods come, she can notice her fertility, uh, her, she can notice it's 12 to 14 days. And from the mucus of the menses starting to the time the mucus comes is not constant, so this can change. We encourage her to understand also that during the time of fertility, there are other changes that occur in her body. So just like she is trained to know when her menses are about to come, by listening to her body's language, the breasts are sore, the, the breasts are full, maybe have a bit of cramping or bloating or whatever it is that she experiences to tell her that she's going to receive her periods. In the same way, we need to teach her that there are changes that occur in her body just before the mucus happens, and those changes are very important. So she wakes up and she looks in the mirror, she has this glowing face, very beautiful skin complexion, no pimples, very clear face. Most women will talk about a glowing face. She is very keen about how she looks. She wants to be careful about what dresses she wears, maybe something that looks nice and warm colors, uh, something that looks um, sexy. She has this extra energy. She will even walk faster than usual. She can do a lot of physical work around the house, just full of energy. And when her friends greet her, she feels like hugging them. And then she's very easily arousable uh, sexually and therefore is very vulnerable. So we tell our girl child, my dear daughter, during the time when you have your mucus and the three days that follow that, you are fertile. You have been given a gift by God that gives us children. This is an important gift that you must learn to manage and manage very well. So remember because God created you to be most attractive and most easily arousable during the time when you are fertile. That is the reason we tell you, don't go to a man's house. Don't invite the man to your house and do not accept any physical contact that is sexually stimulating. 
So when we give those instructions as parents, it's not that we don't trust you, it's not that we don't like you, it's not that we don't trust your man, it's because we know that the way God created you, you are vulnerable during the time you are fertile. And for those who are having uh, friendships like dating, waiting to get married, this becomes an important time to avoid uh, any contact. So if a woman wakes up and finds her mucus and she was going for a coffee date, it is better to call that man and tell him uh, you meet next week uh, because something has come up so that any time you're around him, you're fully in charge of, your, of, your, of yourself uh, before you get to understand how to, to manage yourself. So remember that when we are talking to the girl child, we are not um, talking about the plus three days because she will only notice the period of wetness. It becomes important uh, to tell her about the fertile window a little later on. Now, during this time of self-examination, it's very important that the kind of underwear that a woman wears is, is, is different. Some ladies will wear the normal panties and wear liners, and these liners actually absorb uh, any discharge that comes from the birth canal and will not allow you to, to monitor yourself. The, the, the normal panty that was designed is very useful in holding the pad in place, but when you do not have your periods, the right type of dressing is these bloomers. Now, I know if some of you, I could see your faces, you're already laughing, uh, but the idea of this dress is that it doesn't hug the lips of the vagina shut. So the panty is designed to hug the pad very close to the bath passage. But these ones uh, do not hug the lips closed because remember the lactobacillus, the, the, uh, the, the bacteria that keeps the vagina acidic and healthy requires air. So if you bend and you're not wearing uh, your underwear, you'd feel a bit of air going to the birth canal. That air is very important in keeping the birth canal healthy. And, and, and the usual panties that hug that area closed would not allow that to happen. So this would be the type of dressing that would be important. The, 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 the elastic around the thigh would then mean that if there is any movement of, of a discharge that is trickling down, then it won't go beyond your skirt or into your trousers. It will give you enough time to be able to check what is going on. Now, the, the bloomers are not as ugly as this. Um, there's a lot of uh, more fashionable ones, but um, this would be the right attire when you're not on your periods. And when you're going to sleep, you do not need to sleep uh, in, this, in these clothes, okay? So, now, um, I know time is running very quickly, but uh, what is the difference between uh, this? Um, let me see how much time I have. Um, okay. What is the difference between the fertility cycle and the ovulation cycle? So we know ovulation is just the release of the egg and ovulation will never uh, conceive a child. Uh, we know fertility is the ability of a couple to bear a child. For you to discuss fertility, there must be a man and a woman. Now, um, for a child to be conceived, we need the male seed or the sperm to be introduced into the female reproductive system and to reach the egg. So the difference between the ovulation cycle and the fertility cycle is, is the sexual intercourse, so mating. If a woman is just observing her ovulation, and is not involved in sexual activity, then she is observing her ovulation cycle. The minute a man comes into her life and she is having sexual relations, then we are now talking about the fertility cycle. Uh, a few other things to help you understand the language that is used by the Catholic Church. Um, sexual intercourse is basically the total self-giving um, of a man to a woman or both. And the, the male organ goes into the female organ and the seed is deposited inside the woman. So by definition, sexual intercourse is consensual. There is permission and is open to life. So when we talk about the conjugal act, then we are talking about sexual intercourse that is occurring in marriage. It is what we use to consummate marriage and it is ordered to God's will. And that is licit, this is good. 
sexual intercourse is not the problem. The problem is the timing. Is it in or outside of marriage? So the conjugal act is, is a sexual relation within marriage where the correct organs are used, there is permission, and the seed is deposited into the woman, meaning it is open to life. Now, adultery would then be sexual intercourse that is outside of marriage. It could be consensual, it could be open to life, but it is disordered because it is outside of marriage, okay? Now, <clears throat> masturbation would then be all other sexual experiences where the male seed is not deposited into the woman because it is close to life, then this is also disordered. So when you talk about using sex toys, uh, whether you're going to use the hand uh, to masturbate, whether you're going to use somebody's mouth, whether you're going to use somebody's anus, uh, whether you're using contraceptive, whether you do coitus interruptus and pour the seed outside, all these sexual experiences can be lumped up into one word, say masturbation, it is close to life. You want to have sexual pleasure, but you do not want to have life. Now, remember, a lot of good language has been used. Um, you hear people talk about oral sex and anal sex. It, it doesn't matter. The idea is you are using somebody's mouth to masturbate or you're using somebody's anus to masturbate and it is disordered. Uh, the other one is rape, defilement and bestiality. All of them are disordered because there is no consent. Rape, it could be the correct organs, but you had no consent and you used force, therefore it is disordered. Defilement is a child who is too young to give consent. So they may even agree, but their, men their mental development does not allow them to give consent. They are below the age of 18. That will be considered defilement and it is disordered. Then when there is sexual relations between uh, humans and animals, we call it bestiality, is again raping the, the animal because it cannot give you consent, you don't understand its language, it is also disordered. Now pornography is watching other people's sexual acts, it deliberately provokes sexual thought and it is adultery by thought and it is also disordered. So, just a, a quick preview of, of language uh, that we use in the church that would help you to understand uh, where to place these things. So when the men engage in sexual relations, they should expect pregnancy as a possible outcome. I find it very irritating when people come and tell me, oh, doctor, you know, we're expecting a baby and we are very shocked, we are surprised. And you ask them whether they had sexual intercourse and they say yes. Now, where, 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 whether a couple uses natural or artificial methods, so long as they engage in sex, what they are doing is bad spacing, is not avoiding pregnancy. There is nothing you can use that would help you to avoid pregnancy. What we are doing is bad spacing. If you have sex, then you are bad spacing. You are not avoiding pregnancy. The only way you can avoid uh, pregnancy is by avoiding sexual relations. So let us be very clear even when you use uh, natural uh, methods to space birth, then it still remains open to life and God can give us life. And then uh, the last thing here is that the knowledge of the fertility cycle needs to be made available to all sexually mature persons, whether or not they plan to engage in sexual intercourse. It's very important that people have this knowledge. Now, would this knowledge of fertility cycle or the ovulation encourage immorality? Knowledge of the human life cycle encourages chastity. I've just taken you through the life cycle. If, you, if children understand the place and value of uh, the sexual engagement, then they would not have problems being able to wait or understanding where to place it in their life. Now, ignorance of the ovulation and fertility cycle has not encouraged chastity. All it has done is uh, contributed to the so-called unwanted pregnancies. We have teenage pregnancies. People are using contraceptives because they don't know the natural one. Uh, and this is leading to the uh, demand in abortion. So uh, this can all be reversed by just allowing people to understand this information. Now, morality is a spiritual state. It is based on your understanding of God and our relationship with him. 
The remedy, the remedy for immorality is evangelization, Christian mentorship, and discipleship. So if people are immoral, it is because we have failed to do our Christian duty, and we should not blame them for the state that they are in. Now, <clears throat> the knowledge of ovulation and fertility cycle uh, by a morally upright person who will not promote immorality. Rather, it will empower them to use natural birth spacing options in future. Now, if one is living an immoral life, until we reach them with the good news of our salvation, which is our Christian duty, they will remain in that st state regardless of whether they use natural or artificial methods of birth spacing. But even in that state, the natural methods would remain a healthier option than the contraceptives. So um, I don't know whether I have maybe another five minutes. Uh, Julius, can I spend another five minutes to talk about this? Julius? Okay. Um, chastity is... Uh, oh, is Sorry. Oh, yes, doctor, you still have 15 minutes. Wonderful. Okay, so chastity is control of sexual passion. It's about sexual purity of thought, word, and action. Both boys and girls should be taught the human life cycle because it encourages chastity. Now, family planning, we use this word very loosely, but if you think about it, it should be done before marriage by both the man and the woman, and it is done separately. So if I am thinking of having a family, I should be asking myself, uh, what can I do to be socially independent of my parents? Um, I need to get training, I need to get a job, I need to leave my mother's house before I can talk to anybody about starting a family. Then I can ask myself, at what age would I want to have my first baby? How many children would I want to have? What kind of space would I want to have um, uh, between the children? And at about what age would I wish to have my last baby? So generally just um, a rough idea of knowing um, what kind of uh, family that you would like to have. And uh, it is during that time that we should also teach our children the ovulation and the fertility cycle. Now, dating has been abused a lot. The word dating, I asked a young man what dating means and he told me it is a committed relationship where you're having sex, but it is not leading to marriage. Now that is, is total confusion because marriage is a committed relationship. You cannot be living in marriage and then telling us that you're dating. So the proper dating is about choosing a mate. You have decided you want to settle down and you're looking for a person of the opposite sex. That's why it is a mate, somebody you can have a sexual relation with. And some of the things you look out for in, while dating is whether the person you're dating fears God. You want to, to know whether they know God and whether they fear God. Then you can look at these family planning options of yours. Um, you would like 10 children, then they say they want to have one. That, that goal is too wide. We may not be able to bridge it. There is no need of dating anymore. If they say five and you wanted seven, then that's not very bad. You know, we can compromise. Um, how soon do they want to settle down? I am ready to, to marry in the next one year. My friend says she wants to wait for five years. I stop dating her and I look for somebody else who is ready. And, and that is what uh, should be going around during the time of dating. Okay, so dating would start one or two years before the date you plan to have your first baby. Because if you want to have your first baby two years after finishing college at the age of 26, then as you're finishing college at the age of 24 is when you should now start looking for uh, a person to settle with. Before then, you need to focus on your studies and other things and not waste your time trying to look for a mate because the time has not yet come. Then when you, once you find this one person and they seem to fit everything of 70 or 80% of what you desire, then we go to the next level, which is called courtship. Now courtship is a committed relationship. It is still not marriage. You're still not having sexual relations, but now you're only seeing one person. 
Remember when you're dating, you can date John today and then uh, date Peter tomorrow, then date somebody else until you find the person you're looking for. Because there is no sexual relation, there is no commitment, uh, one can be able to have many friends who are men or many friends who are girls as you try to find your mate. But once you choose one and you like them, then we go to the uh, courtship. You say now we are, we are getting serious and it is at this time that you involve the family. The reason it's important to involve the family is because your head is spinning. You really like this person so much. When you see them, your heart is beating. It's almost coming out through your throat. It is, you would not be in a state to make good choices. You are a biased person. So bring them to us as your parents. Uh, if you are fearing your parents, take them to an auntie or an uncle that you really like. Tell them, uh, uncle, I have found this man, I have found this woman, and I really like them. I want you to evaluate them for me and tell me what you think. So the parents can, and relatives can be able to have, ask a few other questions. Have you been married before? Do you have children? Have you ever aborted? Uh, what kind of family do you come from? Are your parents divorced or are they living together? You know, um, uh, do they come from the same clan as we come from? Do they come from the same region just in case we are relatives? So a lot of background can be checked for you, things that you may not be able to do. Once the family approved this person, then we go to the next level, which we call engagement. This is about showing commitment. In our African culture, we call it dowry. Now, this is the time we teach the couple. The couple that has committed to getting married, we revise with them how to use the fertility cycle for birth spacing and for getting their children. This couple is engaged. They've started going to, to, for, for their lessons in the church. Dowry is when we ask that young man who wants my daughter to go and come with his family and tell us their interest because the young man could be lying to me. And when he goes and he comes with his family to see me as your father, then I tell the family to go and come with a gift to show their commitment. And if they go and they come with a gift that we call dowry, then we now take them seriously. These are people who are serious. This is not a joke, my daughter. Are you ready to get married? And if you are, then we bless you and we ask you to go before God and the community and take your vows in marriage in the sacrament of matrimony. It is after marriage that you must have sexual intercourse. You must have successful sexual intercourse because it is sexual intercourse that consummates the marriage. So remember marriage is the total self-giving of a man and a woman to each other for life. It is open to children and the responsibility is to bring up those children in the fullness of the knowledge of God. Now, sexual intercourse is the total self-giving of a man to a woman. So it comes after marriage and it is the icing on the cake. This is how you give yourself to each other and confirm what you said in church. So sex is very important in, in, in our Christian faith because that is how it consummates marriage. If you are not able to have uh, sexual intercourse after your marriage because the man is impotent or the woman was a man who did a sex change and, and, and looked like a, a, a woman, then that is not, the separation is not called divorce. It is called annulment because it was entered through false pretense or deceit, and therefore it is nullified. So it is very important that sexual intercourse happens and happens successfully. Most young people then ask me, uh, but how we sh shall we know about sex? Every time you have sex with one person, it will always be the first time. You cannot get experience in sex unless you're having it with the same person. You, you, you would end up just trying. Now, the best sex teacher then becomes your spouse because uh, it is a natural phenomenon. If you understand just a little biology, it will happen. Then you start talking to each other. When you touched me like this, I felt very nice. When you touched me like this, I did not feel nice. Please don't touch me like that again. So sexual intercourse is on the job training. Uh, you don't need to know how to do it with the neighbor or the person in the office. It's just your spouse. And so long as you talk to each other, then you can make each other very happy. So sex is the best teacher. Uh, it's on job training. 
So let's do a quick revision of what brought us here. Uh, we have four phases of the cycle, menses, waiting for fertility, fertility, and then fertility is over. Those are the four phases. And we said that the window of fertility is the number of days of mucus that you will experience, which may be one, two, or three, and you add three days where you will be dry, but there is still mucus inside the back canal, it's just that it is not flowing. And when you add mucus plus three days, we get our days of fertility. And we said, this is the time when we should get our baby. And we said, if we are spacing our children from the fourth day after the end of the mucus and before the start of the periods, then we are talking about fertility being over. And uh, that is what I was referring to as a rabbit zone. And when you are having any sexual relationship from the end of the mucus, the end of the periods as we are waiting for mucus, remember you're waiting for fertility. And if your intention is not to get a baby, then we said there are three very important rules. Don't have any sex in the morning, don't repeat any sexual activity, and do not have daily sex uh, during the time when you're waiting for fertility because you want to make sure that you don't have any sexual relation while the mucus is in the birth canal, but yet you do not know. Thank you very much. Um, I will take your questions. Yes, thanks very much, Dr. Wahome Ngare. This has been the most beautiful way to, to come to an end of our, I mean, we're not coming to an end, but at least uh, it was so nice that uh, we have this kind of historical background, how NFP has kind of come up until today on our last day. Maybe I would like doctor to put more emphasis on um, the dangers of pornography, especially now that uh, there is a lot of uh, phones are so many. In fact, in our younger generation, they are going to apps and maybe I would like you to put more emphasis on really the danger of pornography to the future of family life and marriage life. Uh, yes, um, it, it, that would be a topic on its own, but I'll try and uh, answer that very quickly. Um, pornography almost always leads to masturbation. They are very closely related because you have aroused yourself. Now, there are certain dangers. One is that you're teaching yourself uh, to excite yourself sexually without a partner. Now, depending on what you're using, whether it is your hands or the anus or the mouth or whatever it is, the idea is that um, that is not what normal sexual relations would be like. And we have had people who have what we call premature ejaculation. They, they train themselves to, to finish so quickly that when they have a, a, a woman, they cannot satisfy them because they keep finishing quickly before she has even uh, become ready. Now, when it is the woman who is masturbating, then the way they use the hand on the clitoris and other areas of their organs, then is very rough. It is not the way it would feel with, during normal intercourse. And I have had patients who come to me who are not able uh, to experience orgasm when having normal sexual relations because they train themselves to, 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 to masturbate. So that is one of the, the end products uh, of pornography. The other one is um, that you learn to watch sex instead of performing sex. And uh, we have had incidences of people who are only aroused when they see other people having sex. We had a very sad story of um, a gentleman who would hire uh, people to start having sex with the wife as he watches so that he can get aroused enough to now uh, finish. Uh, because when you train yourself to watch sex, it is not again the same as performing sex. The other sad thing about pornography is that it is exaggerated. So you find uh, young people who are watching pornography and they see this size of the penis that is so huge and they look at theirs and they think they're actually sick and they're looking for medicine to make themselves bigger. 
What they don't understand is that it is exaggerated, the size is exaggerated because this is a movie that is created. Uh, the other thing is the duration of sex can be so exaggerated that people are having sex continuously for half an hour and you, you try and in a few minutes you have finished and you're thinking there is something wrong with you. Uh, again, it is very destructive to, 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 um, to family life. So whether it is watching pornography or the outcome of pornography, which is masturbation, both of them are very destructive. But the last one is that uh, every time you get orgasm, you basically produce dopamine um, in your brain. And if you keep bombarding your brain with dopamine, uh, it tends to temper down. And what you get is people going into depression, people have no energy to do work, they have no motivation, and a lot of other problems. So what I'll do, Julia says, I'll send you two clips uh, about the dangers of, of masturbation. And these are just scientific. They have, um, they're not based on, on our faith, but at least it will help your people when you send it to them, they can watch and understand the danger of masturbation. Thank you very much. Um, there is Vanessa Amito. She asked, would you encourage the use of spam site cervical cups? since they are not abortifacient? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. And that's why I was trying to um, explain what ordered and disordered sexual relations are. The, the, the spermicide, the, the, the cups, basically is just like the condom. They prevent the sperm from getting uh, to the egg. In that way, they are close to life and therefore are disordered. So it's not just a question of killing the baby who has already uh, been formed before they implant in the mother. It is the fact that you put a barrier between the sperm and the egg, and therefore you close that sexual relations uh, relationship to the to to life. Now, if you if you imagine a woman who has a 28 day cycle that is regular and uh, she has her periods for four days and she has a fertile period of six days, then you're saying four plus six days, you have 10 days during which you would, ah. you would, skip, you would skip sexual relations, uh, 10 days because four days she's on her periods and six days she's fertile. But then if you minus 10 days from 28 days, it means you have 18 days during which you can have sexual, sex, um, uh, sexual intercourse uh, without having a child. So we are saying if you have the knowledge of the, normal, the, the fertility cycle, God-given knowledge, you can actually use it without preventing the, the sperm and, uh, going into the woman without having a disordered sexual relationship. And you have 18 days out of six days and therefore God is very generous. He gave us more days when we could uh, have sex for pleasure than the days we would actually be able to conceive. Thank you very much. We have another question. This is Annette. Annette asks, can you use alkaline and acidity test to determine fertility window? Uh, is again a, a, a good question. The issue is that uh, we are trying to simplify this as much as possible. In fact, uh, when Dr. Karanja came up with this, um, he, he then went to the area of Trukana and Pokot, and he found uh, he was doing different research, and he found that the women in Trukana and Pokot were having a child after three to four years. And he asked them, what are you using to space your children? And they said, but doctor, we know ourselves. We know when we are fertile and when we are not fertile. So we go to our man knowing that we have agreed to have a child or to space the children. So it is a question of knowing yourself. We want to simplify this method so that everybody can use it. Where will the woman in the village get, uh, get um, those uh, sticks to check whether she is acidic or alkaline? All you need to know is whether you have the mucus or not. All you need to know is the rules and you don't need anything complicated. Uh, and in fact, when Karanja came back to the Kikuyu people where he, came, he comes from and we, where, where, where I come from, he looked for women who are 90 years old and, and older who had not gone through, uh, who had not gone to school, who had gone through the traditional rites of passage. And he asked them, how come you're getting five children? 
and our mothers are getting 12 and 13 children. And she, they would tell him that we were trained to know ourselves. We were trained to know when we are fertile and when we are not. And the men were, uh, were trained to respect women and let them be the ones who guide on when you can have sexual relations or not. So it is a matter of simplifying, not complicating this, this information. So that's a way I would prefer that we looked at it. And uh, the other thing the Pokot women uh, and Chukana women said, not only do they know themselves, they also know their animals. When they look at their cow and they see that mucus, they know the next day you need to bring a bull. It's the same with the goat. This is the same biology we are talking about. So it's not rocket science. Let's not complicate matters. Um, thank you very much, Doctor. We have another question which might be the last for you before we go to the next presenter. Alex asks, Doctor, can you make more highlights on the dangers of abortifacient or abortion to future child bearings? Um, when, when, uh, when I give these talks, even when I talk about contraceptives and, uh, and how we contrast it with natural family planning, one of the things I have avoided totally is to use fear. Uh, I do not like um, uh, talking about the dangers. What I like you to understand is the value of the natural method that does not expose you to the risks that you would take with the fertility, uh, with the, the um, contraceptives. But um, the, the issue, the biggest problem we have with uh, artificial contraceptives is that uh, they all use progesterone. And, and progesterone is the main uh, method of, of contraception. Progesterone is the, is the hormone of pregnancy. So basically, the woman will put herself in, in the pregnancy state. And what happens is that you would get, uh, you would, you would get um, the same things that you get when you're pregnant, like the mood swings and all those things. Uh, but the most dangerous one is, especially when used before the first childbirth, there is a very big risk of brain, uh, breast cancer because the breasts are stimulated, but they are not fully mature. And in that state, the risk of breast cancer is very high. So that is one of the biggest problems we have with the uh, artificial contraceptives. Now, the breast after one has uh, delivered their first baby has fully matured and is protected against cancer. But before that, any use of those methods increases the risk of cancer in a woman tremendously. Um, the other thing is that um, the false sense of assurance, the feeling that you can't get pregnant has made people a bit careless. Uh, and uh, you find um, it's not very strange for a young person who is not married to have multiple sexual partners because uh, there is that feeling of security that uh, she may not get pregnant. What that does is it exposes the woman to um, sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, sexually transmitted diseases like gonorrhea and chlamydia can cause damage to the tubes. And when that happens, then we cannot conceive. Uh, the coil also accelerates the passage of bacteria from the vagina into the uterus where it shouldn't be and can also cause inflammation of the tubes, again, leading to uh, infections and the pregnancies that can um, lodge in the tube, uh, which we call ectopic pregnancies. Um, so that those would be some of the dangers. There are many, I can't list all of them now, but I think what we should do as, 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 um, as people who want to nurture family and to, to nurture life, is to, to give our package and its goodness such that people can contrast it with what they are being given by the world and be able to reach a decision that what we are offering them is better. So not to, to, to use fear, uh, but rather to, to win them by offering them a better package. It, this is what we are offering. These are the benefits, and it will be much better if you use this than if you use the other package. I think we'll be able to win more souls. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, I know there are more questions still coming, and uh, I know.
we can have you here for the whole day, but somehow we must stop somewhere. One thing I want to assure whoever on this Zoom is um, Dr. Home is a humble soul. When we get a chance to invite him again, I promise you that he will come. Doctor, thank you very much. So and, today and, and the, you, you can also you can also assure them that you are recording. So the, those who may have missed some of those things will be able to, to, to look at it at their own time. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I may not be able to stay until the end. If I leave Ali, uh, kindly uh, allow me. Yes, we understand. And uh, we are going to share the link with everyone of the of, uh, the doctor's talk and you won't miss. And uh, I'll share his email that if you have uh, any issue to consult, I assure you that he will respond to you. Thank you very much, doctor. We are so excited and so happy to have you today. We know your busy program and we wish you well as you meet other commitments. Thank you. In Uganda, they say, where are they? So apart from doctor, we have a couple here that will just tell us their story. Today's presentation has been prepared in a way that we have a, a specialist from the medical background who shares this journey. And then we have also a couple who are the users who will also share about this. Welcome. I want to talk about their name because I know they'll begin with that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Most grateful to have this opportunity of sharing with you about material family planning. Mm, as I begin, my name is. Uh, and I'm called Francis Chang Janet. Yeah. When you come to my office, I am a teacher by profession and a head teacher of one of our schools in Jinja District, that is the Kakura Central Primary School. So when you come to my office, you will get me as Madame Ajila Janet, but I'm Mrs. Chang, Francis Jane. Now, some little information to share with you about the national, natural family planning. Some years back, actually some 12 years back, um, I used to, at first, I began by using the contraceptives that was the injector plan, but then it so happened that it treated me badly. I got so serious side effects that I hated the whole system. So one time I went to the hospital, one of our hospitals in Kakra here. When I went there, I asked the nurses that apart from this other artificial family planning methods, isn't there any other you can teach me that I do away with this artificial family planning methods? And they said, yes, there is one. I said, which one is that? And they said, we have what is called natural family planning whereby we use the moon beads. I said, wow, that is what I want. But then they said, can you manage it? I said, I can if taught well. So they advised me to go to the hospital with my husband, whereby I did it. When we went there, we were taught. And the way we were taught, they showed us uh, a bead like this one here. This one is called a mono bead, it's a bead. And they taught us how to use this mini moon bead here properly. That now, wonderful, we are experts because we have always had our children, our children when we feel like 
we want to have a child. But when you don't want to have a child, you cannot conceive anyhow. It has been so good that I've even been able to teach other couples how to use this moon bead here. Now, what I learned with this moon bead is that you should be two as you use this moon bead here. One person cannot use it. It is used as a couple because I cannot use it alone and my husband, or he cannot use it alone. It is something shared in common that we agree the yes and the don'ts. For example, um, a person who is liable to using this moon bead here should be a person who gets her periods after 25 days. For example, after 25, from the, if you receive your periods from 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, to 31, 32, that one there, you're allowed to use this method. But if you receive your periods less than those days, for example, you have, you have not made the six, 26 days, then again, you receive that, that period. That is less than 26. You're not liable to use this moon bed here because you can easily get pregnant. And if somebody who has taught you has not taught you very well, you will continue saying, uh, uh, this natural family planning does not work, but it works. To me, I've tried and testified, it works. But it can only be done in that way. If you can, if you don't reach those days, then don't apply this method. Oh, that is 26 to 32. Then if you can take more than 32 days before seeing your next period, also don't use this one here. So when I always talk to my clients, uh, if somebody comes to consult me, I tell him, can you observe your periods for the first three months? And then after that one, I will continue recording, recording, recording. This month, you get to your producing this day, the next one, like this, the, the third one, like then I'll add, then get the average. Then I'll tell you a person that you are liable to use this method here of family planning. Mm, it has been a very good story all along because it has worked for us. What is most interesting in this moon bead is that it's assumed that every woman goes for her period is for a period of seven days. But then some women take like two days, three days, four to five or to seven. But then what I, what I learned from this method here that is that if you finish a full week when you're having your periods, don't temper using this method. That's what I learned. If you finish maybe, for example, two days, then you have, for example, you're taking in two days, then you have the third day, fourth day, fifth and sixth day, you can have your sex if you feel like. Then after that one, when you use this moon bead here, for example, you have begun your periods here. This is the red, the red bead here. Then you keep moving, count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Most especially for the learners, you can have sex after having your periods. Or maybe if you take three days, you can still have one, two for the beginners. That's what, how I always teach them because for them, they are still young in this method here. But for me, I know where I can apply sex when using this method here. So for the beginners, I'll tell them, don't, if you are having two days for your administration periods, 
just use the one to the next three days you can have your sex, but for the next four days. But then this the seventh one may be dangerous because you never know at what time are you going to have sex. So after the seven days, the assumed days, the seven ones, don't touch your partner after reaching the white beach. Count those beads, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Don't, Tomokwatako, that's in Uganda. Don't touch your partner because these white beads here are showing danger. Anything can happen there. These are fertile days. Then after the, the white beads, see? Yes, sometimes I advise my young partners, the couples, that even the next day after the white bid, don't try risking because you're not yet technical for the beginners. But for me, I know that here I'm okay. Then there are also these other bids here. They're after the white ones, those ones there can have sexy. When you read the, 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 there's a, another bead, the black one in between there, that bead shows that you are, you are about to get your periods, but you can still continue having your sex up to again, when you see the next what, the next blood or the next period. So there's something which is very important, very amazing in this moon bead here, in that. Mm. It's always like this. I've experienced it several times. You have seen your blood, you have seen the, the beads. I mean, you have seen, you have finished your menstruation. Now, in this, when you come to the white beads here, that is the fatal period, is when a woman is sex, sexually active. It's when she will always continue painting the husband, disturbing him, because there's something pushing him that go for it. Then after the, the white beads, then the appetite of the woman goes away. Then if the man touches and says, I don't want, you don't feel like. And yet remember prior to that, it was something very interesting. <clears throat> So it, in most cases, it is always where men may think of a, 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 a partner has got someone else, and yet in actual sense, that is nature. By that time, she, she no longer feels. The other time, when ovulation was still there, hmm? by, by the way, as doctor was explaining, this, the white bead is here. Hmm? Show that eh? this is this ovulation time. There is a fertilization going to take place here. If you are careless with your life, you can easily conceive and get what it, pregnant. Mm. There are also benefits of this uh, natural family planning of the moon bead. Huh? With this one here, there are no side effects. Mm. I don't see that today over I'm feeling headache because I've used this immune bead over, over bleeding like the, the, the other artificial family planning methods. This one here is totally good that those other <laughs> side effects of the artificial family planning methods have. Now, I also experience this because I, I love my husband because he has always supported me. Why and how? My husband has been a good husband to me because but if he learns that is dangerous days, mm -mm, he will not touch. That's in Uganda, that's saying during those people, Taji Kwataku. You know, you see, play cool. And you know that once I touch there, something is going to happen. 
pregnancy is going to do what? To occur. Now, another thing is that he has always supported me in all, at all times. In our bedroom, we have our calendar. We know that during these this days here, we are okay. For example, as we have said that after the white bed, you see this way, you can enjoy your slaves as much as you want. Then after that one, when you see blood, you will again stop there because it's not healthy to have sex when a, a woman is menstruating. That is what I could share. And I advise the women outside there to embrace the natural family planning methods because according to my experience, this moonbeam method works. That I've taught even some people who thought they could never space their children. But through this moon here, they've been able to do what? To learn and they've been able to space their children whereby they thank me a lot whenever I meet them. Thank you. May I give it to my husband to say something? Master, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. the facilitator. Oh, first and foremost, I also want to thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Julius, who introduced this system to us. And Madam Janet. Yeah. So we were the facilitators, the, the, the people who began to introduce the system. The system was really worked on us. And imagine, you cannot imagine. The last born is making 10 years now. And he has even made 10 years. And I think he, we might end there. So for today, I went, I have enjoyed really the lessons. And there are some things that I've learned in that lesson. Me have been messing a lot. Somehow, not only me, but men have been messing a lot. That they always intend to snore early in the evening and forget that sex is not wanted in the morning. In case you do it in the morning, that's when you get a problem. And secondly, it is not a daily thing. Those are the two things that I've quoted. Then the third one was, you know, not repeat sex. It was really a very good lesson to me and I think this should be even taught to other couples and it will help us to get more clients such that the nation should learn how to space children and how to get a child if you are in need, people should learn. Other than being ignorant, the way we have been doing it ignorantly, I really appreciate the teachings. I appreciate the time you have taken with us. And I thank you so much. God bless you for the for that. Thank you so much. Maybe Madam wants to add something. Yeah. Just to add on, just to, as I said, that if there could be a way um, facilitating, you could be able to deliver this information to other people in some other areas. But then sometimes we are limited by transport, sometimes we are limited by time. So if there is a way, if each time, if the opportunity given, you can always go and put this other information to other couples outside there. That is what you could ask me if the government could be able to position to give a helping hand. So that the message, message reaches to every individual who would be interested in this method here. Also, to convince others that these other artificial family planning methods are dangerous to our lives. 
Thank you very much, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, our NFP couple users, as they have said from Kakira, they came here to share their story and that promised. So we are coming to our six hours as we are divided them. We began by two hours on 26th, another two hours on 3rd, and then today on 10th, we are also doing another two hours to make up six. So I'm sure these Six hours have given you a very good grip about uh, natural family planning. And uh, I do trust that uh, we are going to make sense. Many of you have shared your emails and I've been sending some notes in any parts and more notes are coming to, to share with everyone. And, um, and uh, I'm so excited that uh, I think we've gone a good way. And uh, after this, I would love to call Mr. Alex with CJ uh, to give some concluding remarks and also lead us in a closing prayer. Mr. Alex, you're welcome. Hello. Yes, we are getting you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Julius, we thank so much, Julius, for organizing this training. He has been at the center of this all, coordinating, getting the facilitators, getting the links. Oh, thank you so much. We, if we, we were in a physical forum, I would ask people to start up and clap for you. <laughs> but thank you so much. We are so blessed to have you on the Life Club to really do a good job. Yeah, this training was demand driven, and uh, we thank God that uh, people were able to turn up. We thank God for facilitators. This is our part three of part three of the training. Uh, one of the reasons we asked for this training is that uh, we read that some couples who are using contraceptives, which are about first tent and with the effects of, uh, of contraceptives. And the some are already getting the abortion unknowingly using the contraceptive. So I hope all your expectations have been met. Personally, my wife and I have been blessed. We are proud users of natural family planning. I think it's the calendar method. We use an application. And we are here, we are enjoying our marriage. We best go for that. Yes, as just I said, all not to be shared. If you want to on our mailing list, as uh, the host has asked us to share, Mr. Matthias, please share your, all your emails and we shall share all the recordings from part one up to part three. And if you're also able, we shall share all the slides. Uh, also, feel free to reach out to Brad Julius. If you, have, if you need more consultations, you share his name, you share his contacts, you can meet him any time. He give you all the details you need at free of charge. Uh, with this, allow me to pray. Oh, we thank God. Lord, we thank you for this training. We thank you for Brother uh, Julius and Talo. We thank you for the facilitators ever since we began this training. Last month, we thank you for uh, our of natural farming planning because it's a method that you've created uh, to the mothers and the fathers and this forum will ask you that you enable them to also spread this gospel of natural farming planning so that women are not hurt by the effects of abortion, or the effects of contraceptive in the name of Jesus. We thank you all, we praise this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one last thing I'd like to encourage members to 